us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, with the humblest of hearts to thank you, Lord, for Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, because on that cross we heard him say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the precious blood that was shed. And whoever's washed with that blood today not only receives forgiveness, Heavenly Father, and we all needed that, but also, Lord, knows that they are a, children, a child of yours. And there's a heavenly home being prepared for them. And that is our hope, Heavenly Father. And your word tells us, through the Apostle John, whoever has his hope in their hearts cleanses himself. We ask, Heavenly Father, as we bring ourselves before you this morning, Lord, that you reach into our hearts with your word to provide, Lord, what it is that our hearts need. We also pray, Lord, for those who couldn't be among us, that you be with them, Lord, and we pray especially for Sia, for Harris, Lord, for Jessica, for Nick Miyakis, and so many others among us, Lord, who are going through difficult times. We ask for your touch upon them. We also pray, Lord, for the young children this morning as they receive a message in Sunday school, that it also touches their hearts and sows a seed, a seed, Lord, that will bear fruit in the years to come. For all of us, Lord, we bring ourselves before you and ask, Lord, that you deal with our hearts in the way that you need to. In these things we pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Please be seated. I'd like us this morning to continue our journey through the book of Daniel, and we're looking at chapter 6, a very famous chapter, which uh, everyone's heard of the story of Daniel in the lion's den. <coughs> Daniel chapter 6, I'm just going to read the first nine verses. We're not actually going to deal with the lion's den this morning. We'll deal with that next time. But for this morning, Daniel chapter 6, the first nine verses. And it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps may give an account to them, so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the other governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could not find, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counsellors and advisers have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make, firm, to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for thirty days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so it be, they cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Chapter 6 of Daniel is the last chapter con con um, containing the historical narrative of Daniel's life. The first six chapters, six chapters really are a historical account of Daniel's life uh, from the time of the beginning of the exile through to almost now the end of the exile after 70 years. So Daniel was now somewhere in his late 80s. It was uh, the last chapter given to what was happening in Daniel's life. The next six chapters after this have to deal with a lot of visions and prophecy and God permitting, we'll go through those. And one thing I don't like doing with God's word is obviously speculating because a lot of prophecy before it happens uh, involves guessing about what might happen. After it's happened, it's a bit clearer. So we'll deal with that as we get there. But for this chapter, this is one of those most loved chapters in the Bible, which talks about Daniel and the lion's den. And I'm going to draw the line at verse 9 because uh, Daniel and the lion's den is uh, the focus of this chapter and a very important part of this chapter which has a lot to speak to us about how the world may conspire against us and how God sometimes intervenes 
And in this particular case, he sent his angel and said to the lions, no dinner tonight, boys. Don't worry about it. Uh, and that's how we'd like God to act. We would like God to come along and say, I'll take care of all your problems. They're all gone. And uh, we use Daniel as an example and many others in the Old Testament as an example of how that happens. But in fact, before Daniel got to the lion's den, he was already in the lion's den and it wasn't four-footed lions uh, that he had to deal with. It was all those around him, because it says in verse um, 7, all the governors and king of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps and counselors and advisors, everyone consulted and said, how are we going to get Daniel? Um, and they came up with a pl- way to get Daniel because they couldn't fault him in the work that he did. We're going to use the law that he obeys, the law that he, of his God. We're going to use that to get at him. And this means that of the three governors that Darius had appointed in his kingdom, Daniel being one of those, and the 120 satraps and all the counselors and advisors and everyone else under that, Daniel stood alone in the middle of a pack of wolves, we might say, and you have to ask yourself, why would you? We had a person at work a few years back now. He came to my office and said, I don't know what's wrong with me. The, the other lab head wants to get rid of me, but I'm going to stick to my guns. And so after a while, I said, to him, look, if the whole lab doesn't want you there and the whole department doesn't want you there, why would you grieve yourself by being in an environment where no one wants you? you know, there's plenty of opportunities. Maybe find somewhere else where you can get it off your chest and you have to carry this burden with you. Well, Daniel here was one of the three governors, the other two and everyone below him conspiring against him. He was in the the lion's den. And so Daniel finds himself in this very difficult place in a heathen culture, a godless culture. Every other god but his god was worshipped. And so he was already in the lion's den. And so that's what I want us to think about this morning. How does someone who fears God, loves God, wants to serve God, maintain their integrity in our world today as a Christian when everyone around them may be conspiring to bring them down. And to do that, we first need to look at the historical setting of this uh, chapter, what was happening at this point in time. And what was happening was that Israel was taken captive some 70 years earlier, around 607, 608 B.C., Uh, when King Nebuchadnezzar came marching through and took over the land of Israel in Jerusalem, took some of them off as captives to Babylon. He appointed a token king there. In his absence, that king tried to rebel against him, and then after a few years, the whole lot went uh, in in exile in Babylon. Seventy years later, at the end of the previous chapter, King Belshazzar, the last of the Babylonian kings, was uh, thumbing his nose at God, and God you know, uh, doesn't like wasting an opportunity, as I said last time, uh, to remind people that they're dust in his sight. He is a sovereign God. He controls everything. And he put the writing on the wall saying, your days are numbered. Your time's up. And this Babylonian empire, which in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, if you remember the dream of the big statue, this was the golden head, the greatest of all the empires, God told Daniel to tell Nebuchadnezzar. Um, it came crumbling down. And now we have a new empire uh, in this chapter, the Chaldean Empire, uh, with uh, Cyrus, King Cyrus, leading the Chaldeans, uh, the, uh, sorry, the Medo-Persian Empire, uh, leading the Medo-Persian Empire against the Babylonian Empire. And it was overthrown. So now we have a new empire. 70 years have passed. We're not sure exactly how many kings in that period of time, but Daniel started off in Jerusalem, 70 years exile in Babylon, still in Babylon, One empire goes, a few kings, another empire comes, and we're not sure what else God has in store for him, but the end of the previous empire, the beginning of this empire, also brings another change. We don't see it here, but here the first king we come across in the Medo-Persian Empire is Darius. In Ezra, chapter 1, God's word tells us that Cyrus was in fact the king of the Medo-Persian Empire that overthrew the Babylonian Empire, No Cyrus here, Darius here. And Cyrus, in his first year of his reign, we read in Ezra, said to the Jews, uh, allow the Jews to return back to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple. No mention of Cyrus here again. So who's Darius? And here we're in a difficult place because secular history has no record 
of this particular diarist. There's a few other diaristes. Uh, and so who was this diarist? There's a lot of different views. Maybe it was just another name for Cyrus. Unlikely, because there's another passage which mentions King Cyrus and King Darius in the same verse, so that's not likely the case. Maybe it was his son, Cambyses, who, the second, who Darius, who Cyrus appointed as ruler over uh, this area that uh, Daniel found himself in. Maybe there's a lot of other re uh, views. We're not told. We're told there's three mentions of Darius in God's word, one here, one in Ezra and one in Nehemiah. We're not told who this particular Darius was. But it looks like he only reigns for two years. And so let's not speculate any more than that. Uh, all we know that there's been a roller coaster of empires and kings and rulers in Daniel's life. What about the political setting? Who was in charge? Well, Israel was still God's chosen people, uh, his nation. They weren't in their promised land, and we know that because uh, we're told uh, that uh, God brought this judgment upon them, and that's why they were in exile in Babylon. And so instead of God at the helm as Israel wanted, uh, that's what they desired, uh, there were a lot of other people, a lot of other kings, other empires ruling uh, in, uh, over Israel. And Daniel has dealt with this particular issue right back in chapter 1 of uh, this book of Daniel, where he recognised that although Israel was God's, were God's chosen people, because of their rebellion against God, God appointed others to rule over Israel and took the throne from Israel to be able to self-govern. And he caused this, Jesus Christ calls this in Luke chapter 2, I think it's chapter 2, the time of the nations. This was the period where all the nations would rule uh, all, over, all over the world and Israel's desire that God would rule through them uh, wouldn't materialise. And Daniel chapter 1 verse 2 says, And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, that's King Nebuchadnezzar's hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God, and he carried off the temple of his God, of his God in Babylonia and put the treasure in the house of his God. So King Nebuchadnezzar uh, uh, kicked out the king of Jerusalem, took all the valuables in the temple of God and put them in his own temple. And Daniel says, God did this. This was God, God's judgment upon Israel for turning their backs on him. And Isaiah chapter 5 or 6, I which one it is now, talks about the parable of the vineyard. And God says to Israel, through this parable, I had a vineyard. And this vineyard, I took care of. I took out all the weeds, and I ripped out all the stones, I put a hedge around it, I bought the choicest vines to plant in my vineyard. And I had the expectation, I even built a wine press in the vineyard, I had the expectation that I would get good grapes, so I could make wine. And all I got was sour grapes. What shall I do with my vineyard? And God pronounces judgment. I know what I'll do with my vineyard. I want to destroy the hedge. And basically the judgment of God on his vineyard, which he protected, now he withdrew his protection and judgment would come upon this vineyard. A picture of Israel, a judgment would come upon Israel. Uh, so this was God's judgment on Israel for turning their backs on him. And as I said other times, this is what's happening in the world around us today. A lot of people say, where's God? You know, where's God? God is in control. If this is God in control... Imagine if he wasn't in control, what sort of place we'd be living in. Paul tells us in Romans, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools. And the judgment. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their heart. And it continues. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. And it continues. God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting. And we won't go into the list of all those things which God gave them over to because they rejected God. And that's the world that we're living in. And although God's in control because he appoints leaders and he appoints kingdoms and he was doing it in the Old Testament times, and we can't understand how that could possibly work today when we have all these people in charge and we think, how could they possibly be appointed by God? It's God's judgment on the world. And so since the time of the exile, this was a situation for Israel. 
They were living in the time of the Gentiles, and that's the time that we're living in until the return of Christ. They come, the rulers and empires and nations, and they go because God's appointment with them. In Acts chapter 17, 26, we read, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined and pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. From one man, woman, came everyone else and uh, that dwell on the face of the earth and God has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. That what we hear around is not just random events, random people going places, doing things. This is all appointed by God, not that he's the author of evil, but he's handed over man to his debased mind. And what we're seeing today is a result of all that. And history has borne witness of all these things uh, and this truth time and time again. You know, we have prior to the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, well, earlier in the Word of God, we have the Hittites, who were someone to be reckoned with, and then there were the Syrians, and then the Syrians, and who could forget all the pharaohs in Egypt uh, in the Old Testament times, and then we have King Nebuchadnezzar with the Babylonian Empire and the Medo-Persian Empire, and after him the Greek Empire, then the Roman Empire, and then after Christ we have the Huns and the Mongols and the Ottoman Empire, and the Spanish tried their hand at it, in it, and the Russians tried their hand in it, and the British did quite a big job about controlling the world, and uh, so did Mussolini try to do the same thing, and Hitler tried to do the same thing, and Japan tried to do the same thing, and America's a big what, superpower today, and China's uh, you know, trying to do the same thing. And who knows who else will come, which other nation will rise, which other nation will fall, but God's word tells us right, nations rise and fall, and it's appointed by God when that happens. One thing we know, the rulers come and rulers go because of God's appointment of them. Okay, so that's a political setting. That's what we see in the world around us today. That was what was happening in Daniel's time. What about the religious setting? And this chapter is actually quite amazing when it comes to the religious setting. It's not too different from our times today. Uh, the God of Israel doesn't even rate for this king. It's very similar to the previous king and the kings before that. Um, and a heathen empire with many heathen practices, and the king was the highest authority. And so frivolous was their thinking of the concept of God that they had a bright spark idea. Let's make our king God for a month. I can imagine some rulers today saying, uh, I'd be in that. Let's make our king God for a month. And Darius likes the idea and he signs a decree that he wants to be God for a month. That no one else receives any worship. But and so he gives us a picture of the situation that Daniel finds himself in. It wasn't just uh, a heathen culture, but the whole concept of God was so confused, so contorted, distorted in their minds that just about anything, anyone could become king and because Darius was uh, the top dog in this particular society, um, and out of envy against Daniel, obviously, uh, they want to make him God for a month. Uh, so even their gods take a back seat to their king for this particular month. So that tells us a lot about the religious climate that Daniel finds himself in. And so the social, political, and religious environment for Daniel uh, is a very, it's a bit difficult. So how do you, as a man of God, what, did you, what do you, as a man of God, do if you're living in such an environment? You know, we think we're living in a, 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 a terrible, confused, corrupt world today, and we are, uh, and so was Daniel. Um, what do you do uh, in this particular environment if you want to be true and faithful to God? Where do you start? Well, this chapter tells us how Daniel conducted himself and there's a number of lessons here for us if we're living in a godless society. Now, you know, we generalise when we say these things because not everyone in our society is godless and not everyone has abandoned God. Some people fear God in their own way, their own thinking. But how do we uh, deal with... Uh, uh, how do we deal with what's happening around us with our own lives living in a society that we live in? And 2 Peter chapter 3 it tells us something 
about how we are to live our lives in this society. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, the world around us, it's all going to go. What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace. Don't make a fuss. Be in peace. Without spot, don't allow the world to corrupt you and blameless. Beyond reproach. Don't make yourself a target for criticism. Now that in this world is difficult, as Daniel finds out, it's actually difficult. They target you whether you like it or not. But that's the instruction we get from Peter, and that was Daniel. You know, we don't see him stirring the pot, agitating, saying to the king, right to the king, saying, King, what are you doing? You know, the thousand people you've appointed along with me to rule over you, or whatever number of people it was, you know, they're doing this for me. He doesn't make a fuss. And we see later on from their own confession, they couldn't fault him. They tried to find fault in the way he served his king, and they couldn't fault him. They tried to find other faults, they couldn't find any fault. So he was living in peace, without spot, and blameless. See, Daniel wasn't distracted by everything that was happening in the world around him. He wasn't distracted by the revolving door of world events and world leaders, because for Daniel, God was still in control. That's what he says from the start, and that's what he continues to say. God was still in control. Some time back I saw the movie The Butler, uh, the black American Cecil Gaines, I think, who lived through eight presidents in the US. Anyone seen that movie? Maybe some of you have. It's it's an interesting movie. He saw so many changes in his life, so many different presidents. That's what Daniel saw. So many changes in in his life, different empires, living in exile, different kings, different flavours of kings. Uh, And he could see in all this, empires rise and fall. Uh, They don't make the world a better place. They're appointed by God and sometimes for judgment, most times in Daniel's life for judgment, sometimes for blessings, but today mostly for judgment. And he warned these kings about their need to submit themselves, to humble themselves before God. Um, And uh, most of them ignored what he said, even King Nebuchadnezzar, who finally came to his senses, largely ignored what Daniel said. And in ignoring what Daniel said, Daniel didn't stop. Daniel was immovable in his faith to God. He continued steadfast with obedience. He continued to serve God in the way that he could in whatever office, occupation he had. And didn't try to convert Babylon or the Persian Empire to Judaism or to Christianize, we would say, the world around him. He didn't try and do that, didn't go hide in a cave to find some safe space for himself to fly under the radar and there serve God. He didn't do any of that. He didn't hide in the temple. He didn't have a temple. Nor did he hide in some underground cell group to say, this is where I'm going to serve God. He didn't hide in any of those places. He was an incredible, constant, unchanging, unwavering, steadfast and immovable. And why? why how how could he be like that? He was the most senior public servant under Darius. No, he was the most senior public servant under Darius, the most senior public servant in a heathen and a godless society. How do we make sense of that? How can you excel in a godless society, a heathen society, when everyone's against you, to become second in charge, to be the most valuable and trusted person that the king has on his staff? And Daniel, what about God's law and people's need to obey it? And what about all the worship of false gods that's happening all around you. How are you putting up with these things? Daniel, from your position of influence, you should be able to stop all these things and do some good and stop the rot that's obviously continuing and was continuing in Daniel's time. Why not speak out against the king being God for a month? You should, you're no better than that, Daniel. Why don't you speak out against him? Being silent endorses such sinful practices. But Daniel knew in his mind that God doesn't want us to stand up against the judgment that God himself imposes on a culture, on a society, on a world because of the rebellion against him. He wants us to be a light in this world and our lives pointing to Jesus Christ, the answer, the only answer that can touch people's lives and bring them back to God. Many Christians can't see what Daniel saw. They're trying to convert a, goal, uh, a world to Christian ethics, Christian morals and principles, um, 
can involve with various lobby groups and bombard their MPs with emails, and I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying that's, we think that's how we're going to change the world. But what changes the world is when God is put back in his rightful place and God's judgment on the world changes. And all these things that are happening look so big in our eyes. You know, at work we've got this, a few fancy balances which weigh out minuscule amounts of drugs. And one of them can measure down to uh, the fourth decimal place of a gram. So that's one ten thousandth of a gram. A very small amount. Uh, and we have them mounted on a concrete slab so that no bumps in the building, nothing. You know, someone slams the door three levels down, it doesn't affect our balance. And there's two air dams around us, so no wind can affect the balance. Because you're measuring a tiny amount of whatever it is you're measuring out. And you hold your breath when you're doing it because it can also move the balance. You know, tiny specks. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 15 says, Behold, the nations are as a drop in the bucket. And are counted as a small dust on the scales. We see these amazing powers and nations and all the stuff that's going around us today. Dust for God. Psalm 46 verse 6 says, The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice and the earth melted. They make so much fuss and so much noise. And when God speaks, it all melts. And Daniel knew this also. Two chapters earlier, he told King Nebuchadnezzar about the judgment on him to become like an animal for seven years. This decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones. In order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will and sets over it the lowest of men. The significance of the high and mighty around us in this world is like dust totally insignificant to God. Uh, the only thing that matters to God and the only thing that should matter for us today is not to be found good in this kingdom that we're living in, but in the kingdom of God that is to come. And who will enter this kingdom? Jesus Christ tells us. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now that should make us stop and think. Now not whoever thinks they're doing what's right. Now whoever thinks that they're doing the best they can, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so we come back again to the question now, how does one deal with all the evil in the world? Do we just ignore it? What do we do? How did Daniel cope in this anti-God world that he was surrounded with? You know, there's abundance of evil in the world. You don't have to go far to see it. You know, some people make it their lifetime ambition, Christians, their lifetime ambition. Here it is and there it is and how terrible this is and how terrible that is. Don't waste your time. God's told us how terrible it is. That's why his judgment is upon the world. That's why we're seeing it all around us today. And our job is not to froth at the mouth at all the evil, but to shine as a light, as Daniel did, shine as a light in the midst of a dark and perverse generation that people may come and understand that Jesus Christ is the answer Jesus Christ is the one that makes a difference in people's lives. Not as in the religious appendage, but because he, when he comes into the heart, he regenerates us from the inside, the work of the Holy Spirit, to make us his children, to make us new creations in Christ. And not to lose heart when the people around us don't respond. Not to take it personally. Because he already warned us that's likely to happen. Jesus said, or God's word rather says in John chapter 1, verse 5, And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Jesus Christ came, light in the darkness, and didn't comprehend it. It couldn't grasp it, couldn't understand it, couldn't see it. And Jesus says in John chapter 3, verse 20, For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. So let's not take it personally, because Daniel didn't take it personally. He accepted the world around him was broken, that's what it was, and he, was, he finds himself in it. The world's far from God and he doesn't join in any resistance group to change it. He maintains his faith in God, recognising that it was God who was bringing judgement and it's God that can change hearts and he had to stand as a pillar of light where he was, but it's an example to those around us, around him, what it means to love and serve God. Now there's something else in this chapter that we don't like as Christians, but it's a truth that comes from God's word. 
And that is that not everyone in this world is a fool. And as silly as Darius was to think he could be God for a month and whatever that meant for him, um, it says in verse 1, it pleased Darius to do something. It pleased Darius to organise himself because he knew the human condition and he would set up three governors and under them 120 satraps to look after all the provinces that were in this empire of his so that he would not suffer loss, that the king would not suffer loss, that you know, the right thing would be done by those who are under him. As despite the king's ignorance of God's word, of God, sorry, uh, he wasn't a fool. And sometimes we, play, we paint the world around us. Uh, everyone in the world is a blundering uh, idiot, doesn't know what they're doing, you know, doesn't know what's, right, what's up and what's wrong. And God's word comes to tell us, as bad as it is out there, the most damage that occurs for God's cause is not done by the world around us, it's done by us as Christians. In Romans 2.24 it says, The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, because of us. Let's think about that. Daniel, one of the top three public servants in this particular kingdom, uh, it was a very important position, and not giving to anyone but someone who was trustworthy. And the king would have considered Daniel and the, others, the other two governors uh, trustworthy. Uh, how does someone who does not walk the course that this world follows uh, climb so high in a culture that doesn't recognise God? How does that happen? How, did, how does Daniel get to this? And how does it happen when Darius cared very little about the idea of God? I mean, he, he signed a, the law saying he was going to be God for a month. This Daniel is good, according to Darius. He's trustworthy, and it says here he entertained the idea of making Daniel the senior of the three governors to oversee the other two governors, to oversee the 120 satraps and everyone under those people. And you have to ask yourself, how is it that Daniel gets to this position uh, in, in a godless society, in a, in a heathen culture? How, how does that happen? Well, God's word tells us here in verse 3, then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. He had an excellent spirit in him. And whatever, whatever we might think of this particular king and his idea of God, the king saw that Daniel had an excellent spirit in him and irrespective of how godless that society was, the king thought, I'm going to make Daniel my right-hand man, next in charge under me, uh, because he has an excellent spirit in him. Certainly attitude shines, or should shine, through everything that we do. But it was more than just attitude here that the king saw. He had an excellent spirit. You know, there was a package before him that had to do with integrity, with honesty, with wisdom and experience, like nothing else that he had in his kingdom. And whatever Daniel had in terms of his own personal belief and faith in God, he is the right person to serve me in this particular position. You know, sometimes we paint the world uh, and everyone in it being broken. That's correct. You know, there is none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we can cite all those verses. But that doesn't mean that everything a man says and everything that a man does is a demon in disguise. And Darius, who was not a God-fearing man, was pleased to appoint Daniel, the most senior public servant in his kingdom. And he knew at the head of the class was Daniel because of this excellent spirit that Daniel had in him. And I want us to think about this in our lives today. Should we not be leaders by examples? Wherever we are, whatever situation we find ourselves in, whatever our workplaces are, because employers want employees that do their work well, right? And that's not a measure of how good Christ, a Christian I am because that has to do with my relationship with God. But Daniel's relationship with God is built into a very practical part of his life, even though he lived in a godless society, a heathen society, and so much so that all those that he worked with 
recognized, like the king, he's different. He has an excellent spirit in him. His co-workers knew that as well. And that's why uh, they wanted to find some way of discrediting him because their problem wasn't Daniel's faith. Their problem was their selfish ambition. Why should Daniel get this position? You know, what about us? And maybe even more than that, Daniel is a man of integrity. We can't get away with anything we used to be able to get away with before. There's a lot of reasons why they would not want Daniel there. Uh, but they couldn't fault him. They couldn't fault him the way he did his work. They couldn't fault him in his own personal life. Just, just have a think about that. You know, imagine what our boss would say if the IT department came to him one day and said, you know, Philip, he was browsing online, very inappropriate sites, and he was checking his shares 10 times a day and his superannuation five times a day, and he was shopping and he was on eBay and he was doing all these other things. Yeah, how that would reflect on you and I as a Christian? How does it reflect on us when Daniel, for 70 years in Babylon, in exile, not in his home country, in a heathen and godless society, all those around him couldn't find one fault in this man? Now, I'm not putting him up on the pedals and saying he's a perfect person. You know, no one's perfect, so we have the excuse. But I'm just asking us to think about our relationship with God and how it translates to the way we are with the world around us. How it translates into some very, something very practical. How we are at work and what our earthly masters, if you like, see in us. The way we do our jobs. Because Darius, as heathen as he was, something said to him, Daniel has an excellent spirit. And this excellent spirit meant Daniel did his job perfectly for the king. As I said earlier, that wasn't a measure of his relationship with God. But it was an indication of where his relationship with God was. And as much as God's word tells us, don't be overcome with selfish ambition and let that rule your lives. At the same time, God's word tells us that whatever we do, we have to do to the best of our ability. In Peter and Ephesians, it tells us, in concerning earthly masters, serve them as if you're serving Christ. Me serve my boss as if I'm serving Christ, really? And yet that's the example of Daniel here, faultless. Faultless, and that was his witness in the society in which he lived, that his God stood above everything around him, more important than anything else around him, and translated into a man that did his work. And I'm not promoting here, work hard and you know, don't worry about anything else in your life. It's just one example of how Daniel's life uh, was so visible and how everyone could see he had an excellent spirit in him. And if we go late next to his spiritual life, again, we can see exactly the same practice. They sign the decree, worship no one, serve, not, pray to no one except the king. And Daniel did what he always did, the Bible tells us. We didn't read it further down. We'll look at that next time. He did what he always did. He opened his windows and he prayed towards Jerusalem. And they were there waiting to catch him. So they can go to the king and say, King, didn't you say we ever praised anyone else? Should we throw the lion's den? Daniel. The one that you thought had an excellent spirit in him, the one that you were going to appoint, and that all happened because of selfish ambition. Not because of Daniel's faith, but because of selfish ambition. And we should take, make note of that. That we live in a world that is full of selfish ambition. And they tell us it's dog eat dog out there. And we can play that game and sometimes we'll get eaten and other times we'll try and bring other people down. But as children of God, the expectation of God's word is not to be like them, but to be as children of God, serving God with it in our lives and doing our work in a way that reflects who it is that lives in our hearts. So Daniel was already in the lion's den. And they were gathering around for the kill, not because of his God, but because of their selfish ambition. And Daniel was above reproach. That's amazing. How could you live your life for 70 years and have all your critics standing around you, 120 plus the other two and who knows who else? Not one point to find fault in your life. Daniel became a target because of the ugly face of human jealousy. There's a price to pay 
for being in a position of blessing by God. And that price is envy. People around you become envious. When you do your job well, they become envious. When you live your life well, they become envious. Even when God blesses you, they become envious. Even Christians become envious of Christians that are blessed by God. Look what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1. I won't read the verse, but he's he's saying that uh, he was a prisoner and some were adding to his affliction uh, by saying evil things about his ministry and about himself. And Paul says, no problem, they're preaching Christ out of envy, as long as Christ is preached. Now, that's a different spirit. That's an excellent spirit. And that's a spirit each of us need to have in our lives, living in this culture in which we live in. To be an example to those around us that we're not like them, not because we're better people, you know, we're elite in some other sort of way, but because he who lives in us is the Lord himself. Is Jesus Christ, the one that came to die for man's sin, to die for us and to provide salvation for us. And when we're in the firing zone, I just want to leave with a couple of beautiful scriptures to help us deal with it when we do get in the firing zone. One from Genesis about Joseph. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. As for you, Joseph says to his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. They meant evil against Daniel. They they mean evil against us. If we stand our ground and remain faithful to God, God can use us in the middle of that difficulty to be a blessing to those around us, to point them to Jesus Christ. And also in James chapter 6, verse 11, we just finished James Bible study on Wednesday night. It says here, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. And when you look at Job's life and what Job went through, the last thing you think of is God being compassionate and merciful uh, and that God intended all this uh, for some good purpose. It's the last thing that crosses our minds. But that's what God intended for it. And all the difficulties that come into our life, God's intention is not to bring us down, to break us. God's intention for us, or his desire for us, is to shine like a light in a dark and perverse world. For people to see that you can live in this world and you can live a holy life because he who lives in us is Jesus Christ. And that message should be the message that comes out of our lives to those around us. Now we think of various political views and you know, whatever is happening in the gender ideology space and all the other things that are happening around us are terrible things. But what they need to hear is that Jesus Christ saves. He saved me and he can save you. May God bless his word in our hearts and give to each of us uh, according to our needs as he knows best.